thank the, the locals to contributing to us. Oh, um, our president uh, reminds me to thank our, our members and any friends that contributed the old bills to the geologist of Jackson Hall as well. It helps us in um, making these programs work. So I'm going to turn the floor over now to the eminent Dr. Smith. <laughs> Bob, it's all yours. Thanks, John. Um, Pleasure to, to introduce to you folks Professor Marjorie Chan, and she's accompanied here with her husband John. And uh, Marjorie's a professor at the University of Utah. She's a specialist in sedimentology and stratigraphy, and is the person, who, the first person I met who really opened up the field of depositional environments, etc. In southeastern Utah, the book list has gone on to looking at such that features around the globe and the planetary system. So she's had a 35-year career at the University of Utah. She's authored over 123 peer review articles, and she's given over 170 national and international lectures around the world. She's been on the National Academy Subcommittee or the Committee on Geological Sciences, and has been the distinguished international lecturer for the GSA, where she's given 53 lectures in six different countries. She's a University of Wisconsin graduate, PhD, and she's been in our department as a faculty member and served as department chairman for several years. Uh, one of the things I remember about Marjorie, she's been very interested in teaching and students, and, <clears throat> and in doing so, she won, she won the Outstanding Faculty Teaching <coughs> Award in our department several years ago. But then she's gone on to Mars and things related. And uh, she's developed an interdisciplinary course called Mars for Earthlings. <laughs> and her latest few decades have been working in the area of Mars, where she's going to talk to us tonight. And uh, I want to say that she's really put together a core curriculum of geography and sedimentology in the department curriculum and carries that on. And, uh, She's graduated now 25 PhD and master's students. She was really instrumental. A lot of you, went, you've been with me when I've taken you down for tours of the new building in the Department of Geology and Geophysics at the University of Utah. Margie was very instrumental in planning that building. And I will say academically, she's the person that I think really put together the ideas of how we teach in that kind of an environment and when we built the building. So I really appreciate that. She's a leader of leaders. She worked for the American Association of Petroleum Geologists for Professional Women, and she's been involved with many of the fundraising organizations of all the societies I'm speaking of. So it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Marjorie Chan, and she'll talk to you about things that are not earthling, but are <laughs> Bob. 
while. Um, and thank you all for coming out on this chilly evening. <laughs> uh, Bob took us out to look at the Tetons, and most of it was shrouded in, in clouds, but we got to see the lower thousand feet, I think. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about what I often call the three Ds, dunes, deformation, and diagenesis. And I'll explain what all of these things are, but you see these pretty pictures, and you're going to get to see a lot of pretty pictures from southern Utah. So when I use the name frontiers, what I'm talking about are uncharted territories. And I think there are many frontiers in sedimentary geology as we apply our knowledge from Earth and apply it to some of the newest things that we're seeing on Mars. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through four main things. Number one, I'm going to talk to you about Aeolian dunes. These are like big sand dunes in a desert, and I'm going to give you a perspective about that. Secondly, I'm going to talk about soft sediment deformation. And these are the kinds of things that happen when you have earthquakes. And you're, you're familiar with earthquakes here. And uh, one of the ideas is how do we recognize earthquakes in the geologic record? And how do we uh, determine what their strength has been? Um, the third thing I'm going to talk about is diagenesis. Diagenesis, dia means secondary, and genesis is origins. So what are some of the secondary things that happen in sedimentary deposits on the Earth's surface temperatures and pressure conditions? And then the fourth thing I want to talk about is what's going to happen in the future. And I think the future is going to be really exciting. Not a lot of people have been talking about this to public lectures, but I think it's really important for you to know what's going to happen in the future of our science. So I'm taking you to southern Utah. Uh, you know, just one state away from where you are. And what we're going to do is go to the Colorado Plateau, which is down here. And we have many units here that are like layers in a cake. Uh, these are layers that are horizontal, they're relatively undeformed, and what's so fantastic is everything <coughs> is well exposed. The rivers are like the knife that cuts the cake, or cuts the layers, and really exquisitely exposes them. And so I'm going to tell you three stories. Uh, number one is going to be about wind processes. And these are largely going to be uh, in the Navajo sandstone, mostly around this area, number one. And that corresponds to this unit here, uh, Jurassic and Age, you know, the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, the second story I'm going to tell you is about deformation, which will be in these two units where I have the number two. And then the third story I'm going to tell you about is diagenesis. That will be in the White Room sandstone of Canyonlands and uh, some examples again from the Navajo. Most of my work is centered around the Navajo sandstone, which is one of the more spectacular units in many of the national parks of southern Utah. So one of the questions you might wonder is, why are we focusing on desert systems? Uh, we call these Eolian, which are wind-blown dune systems. And there are several reasons. And one is that these often form very thick reservoirs in the subsurface. And because many of you, I think, are, have been associated with the oil and gas industry, um, you know that it's important to understand earth examples to apply those to the subsurface. Secondly, uh, we find that many of these terrestrial deposits are very good at recording climate signals. And they can tell us what's happened on a global scale. And then uh, many of the colors that you see in these kinds of units are the product of how fluids have actually moved through the rocks. And oftentimes it's hard to tell where fluids have been and how they've actually moved through. But by looking at some of the products that, and the mineral precipitates that have been left behind, we can tell what the fluid flow records are. And then one of the last things is that wind processes have dominated uh, many of the features on Mars, so we can use these examples <coughs> to make inferences about the geology of Mars. Now, when you think of Aeolian systems, many people think that this is just boring sands, just a big pile of sand. What could be interesting about that? Um, and this is what the Navajo sandstone looks like down in Grand Staircase, Escalante. But I want to uh, assert that this is actually much more than just a pile of sand. <laughs> there is a lot going on here. And one of the challenges is, can we figure out what's gone, gone on here? And in fact, when we think that this was an ancient desert, it was not this dry, lifeless desert. In fact, when we go and look at some of these examples, we see lots of evidence of life. And the evidence of life goes from the smallest insects up to dinosaurs that would have been at the top of the food chain. So how can we have this diversity of life from these really small things all the way up to the dinosaurs in a desert? Because we don't think that deserts are you know, that great of a place to live. 
but actually there are times when the water table was probably pretty high. And in fact, along some of these um, forests, some of these beddings uh, of the dunes, you can actually see dinosaur footprints. So what were dinosaurs doing walking up these sand dunes? Uh, there must have been food around. And we know that there was petrified wood, there were trees, there's all kinds of burrowing organisms. So there had to be life in order to sustain uh, dinosaurs living in the desert. Um, what we're seeing on Mars is that many of the features on the surface of Mars are very similar to the kinds of wind processes that we see on Earth. We can see the same kinds of sand dunes. We know how wind has blown and shaped the surface of Mars. We also see features like these, which are these little curly cues which are dust devil tracks. And so on the surface of Mars, the wind is swirled around and made these kind of fantastical little spirals. So we do know that there are comparable features of the wind on both Earth and Mars. And in fact, one of the latest finds um, from the Curiosity rover, um, it's exploring the area of Mount Sharp. And some of these features that have been imaged are um, intermediate dune sizes. Uh, these are some of the ripples, these smaller, kind of wrinkle-looking forms. But some of these crests here that are relatively sinuous are ones that uh, are more of an intermediate size that we don't really have on Earth. And so some of the things that people are thinking about, I'm not sure if I'm in the way of, of people seeing, but some of the things they're thinking about is that these um, forms may, might have been when the atmosphere was different than it is uh, presently. Maybe it was thicker and it was able to drag and make these kinds of intermediate bed forms. Um, some of the pictures of the close-ups of uh, in Gale Crater are showing strata that looks like this. And people have said this looks exactly like southern Utah. I mean, you can hardly tell the difference, but this is cross-bedding. Um, and again, <coughs> suggesting that there are features of Eolian um, wind-blown processes. Now, one of the latest things that I've been working on is in southern Utah, there's this um, unusual feature. And one of the great things about the internet is you can propagate some idea. It'll just kind of take off. And so people saw this picture, and people have been calling this the cosmic navel. <laughs> uh, you might kind of get an idea of why they call it that. You have this, this kind of deep pit, and then you have this kind of belly button or this little uh, pedestal right there in the middle. Now, why are we getting these kinds of things? Well, this is a place where the wind conditions are converging, and it's just the right kind of wind conditions to actually funnel and kind of swirl the sand around so you're abrading and kind of uh, scraping down the walls of, of that area um, to make this kind of feature. This is a, a fairly big feature, about 60 by 20 meter pit. Now, one of the interesting things is that when you look at this uh, at another view, here you can see the sand. The sand will actually move from side to side uh, during different seasons. And there are different features that we can see within this, um, even some of these things that look like chatter marks or these um, little step-like features or where the wind is actually swirling and eroding uh, the sides of the wall. Now, on Mars, we see similar types of features, um, things that look like a moat around a, a central feature, almost like a castle. This is Mount Sharp here. This is Gale Crater. Um, and this is the site of the landing of the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity Rover. And so one of the questions has been, how did it get to be that kind of shape? You know, we had an original basin, which was a crater impact. But we have this kind of pedestal that's kind of sticking up in the middle. And what happened to all the sediments that would have been around here? And through some of the modeling, um, some of the ideas are that wind erosion indeed was strong enough that it actually kind of eroded away much of the sediment to leave a, f a feature that looks a little bit like that cosmic navel that I showed you. And this is how we're using Earth examples to try to explain some of the features that we see on Mars. There is one major difference, and that is the scale is totally different. The, the thing I was showing you in southern Utah is very small, whereas this is very large. And in fact, this, this mountain here is you know, over um, 5,000 feet of sediment. I mean, this is, this is a great big thing. This is 154 kilometers across. So um, to just give you a little bit of a perspective on Eolian systems, and here's a nice Mars dune here, um, the idea is that there's still a lot of questions. We're often wondering, like on Mars, how old is the sand? Where did it come from? Has it been recycled? And where is it going? And what's the flux of the sand? And what about some of the scales? 
So some of the frontier areas, uh, excuse me, some of the frontier areas that I think are important are really understanding some of the complexities of these Aeolian systems. And we're still trying to have a better idea about what are some of the controls by looking at Earth examples. Now, the second story I wanted to tell you about was soft sediment deformation. And I think by anybody's standards, this is a, a really spectacular picture of layers that have just been warped and swirled around. And how did it get that way? Uh, we think this had to happen while the sediment was still soft. It wasn't totally hard. Um, and so uh, if it's soft, it kind of swirls around like this. Um, and these are some spectacular examples. These are from the area that's called White Pocket, which is just below the Utah-Arizona border. Um, some of you have heard of the wave in southern, um, southern uh, Utah, northern Nevada. The wave is very difficult to get into because it's a lottery system, but everybody uh, goes there to take photographs and it's on calendars and such. But probably the area that I think is almost equally spectacular is White Pocket. And all you need is a four-wheel drive and high clearance vehicle to get in. And you can see from these Google Earth images why this is called White Pocket. It's this exposure of white sandstone that kind of sticks out from some of the vegetation around it. And when you uh, enlarge this over here towards the right, you can see that there are about a dozen ridges here. And these ridges are kind of odd because they're not like fault ridges or something like that. These are spaced about 40 to 60 meters apart. And the interesting thing is that um, these uh, mounds are actually oriented perpendicular to the direction of the paleo wind. The paleo wind would have been coming towards the south southeast. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do is take a closer look at this. And to take a closer look, we thought it would be really helpful to have kind of a bird's eye view. Now we started doing this work about 10 years ago, and this was before everybody had quadcopters and GoPro cameras. And so what we were using were these remote controlled airplanes. And Ron Brun, my, um, my colleague, is a hobbyist. And so he was able to mount cameras on these remote controlled airplanes. And sometimes we used kites and mounted uh, cameras on the kites. And we could actually get this kind of bird's eye view that would be intermediate between Google Earth and just being on the ground. And so we got some fantastic pictures that I'm going to be showing you. Now, on the ground, what we see is there, there are different facies, um, different kinds of packages of rock. Some are these cross-bedded sandstones that represent ancient sand dunes. And then we see that there are some changes that my husband's kind of standing right here in the change, where it goes into these deformed units. And then you actually see some, some weird things going on here, where it's getting kind of swirly. And um, these are examples of deformed sandstone where um, the, the units have been forcefully uh, moved and they have some internal shears and faults. And then you can see that it goes upward into places where pieces of the rock actually got ripped off and incorporated as a breccia. And it's in this mostly massive looking sandstone that's shown here at the top. So this transition of these different facies or these different rock types are telling us a story of something big that happened. Now, when you look at the breccias, they look something like this. You can see these pieces that have been ripped off from this lower part here. Some of these are as big as a kitchen sink. And you can see some of the internal lamina that are still preserved inside of those, um, those breccia pieces. When you are on the ground, you can see that there are some of these ridges that I mentioned are raised up. And we would have had a massive sand blanket that came across. But this is one area where it's been eroded. And you can look inside and almost get a window into what's underneath. And what's underneath is where these um, crossfit sets are actually deformed. And they almost kind of look like they're turned up on end. And we think that probably inside of these, um, these ridges, this is where the deformation is actually almost vertical. And so that's why these areas are kind of popped up. And you can see some of the breccia pieces that are here below. Here's a view from our remote control camera. And it's really an impressive view when you look close up. I don't have time to talk about these weathering patterns on the sandstone. But even these weathering patterns are similar to some of the features that have been recognized on Mars. But here you can see these uh, features that are these almost like uh, a ball underneath a rug. And these are places where the um, deformation is intense underneath those, those areas. 
here you can see the example of the deformed sandstone. You can get an idea of some of the breccia rip up pieces. And you can get an idea how this is like a massive sandstone blanket. And um, these are the places where uh, it's cored by some of these upturned dune sets. Um, and probably the fine grained layers where it's red, those were the confining layer that had a lower permeability and was kind of almost keeping like a lid on the water as it wanted to kind of push upward. And so it had to kind of force itself upward at certain places. So I want to explain a little bit of this. This is my favorite picture of all the ones that we took with that uh, remote controlled airplane. And it almost looks like somebody took an egg beater and kind of stirred up those sediments. And, and this is really unusual to be able to see this kind of exposure. Um, associated with this, we can see some of the massive sand blanket. And this looks like everything that was in that sandstone just fell apart or just lost all of its integrity. And so this is probably induced by liquefaction, by, by strong ground motion that actually shakes the sediment and causes it to lose all its original features. So the idea that we have here um, for these uh, sand dunes is that probably uh, the water table was relatively high. And maybe even it was raised during a, a period of strong ground motion like a, an earthquake. And as you're raising the water table, there are differential stresses. There's a liquefaction resistance here where the dunes are high, and there's less liquefaction resistance where the package or you're in these inner dune areas and it's thinner. So there's differential loading, and that's going to affect how everything responds. So when these dunes are being shaken, <coughs> what would happen is that the dunes would kind of founder and split and move apart. And so uh, as water is pushing upwards, it's going to push upwards where there's the least liquefaction resistance. And what would happen is that the sediment goes here from having strength, and then as you get this cyclic mobility and the shaking, the sediment actually becomes softer until it reaches this steady uh, state of flow. And so it's this dynamic deformation that's really causing a lot of these patterns that we see in the rock, including the massive sandstone, which would be uh, something like this uh, orange blanket here that would be coating or topping uh, some of these features underneath these uh, cord parts of deformation. So this is really showing this transition to a steady state flow of the sand shown here and it's really destroying a lot of the structure and it's all suggesting that there has to be a high water table with a lot of liquefaction going on. Now we try to figure out where would these things happen and why would they happen? Well, it seems that um, most of the tectonic action was going out here on, on towards the, uh, the west, out towards Nevada. And so the area of White Pocket is relatively far away, like maybe you know a couple hundred kilometers. So if this is the source of strong ground motion and maybe the source of earthquakes, we might actually have to have a very strong earthquake. And so this graph really shows um, distance of the epicenter to the location of the liquefaction. So at 700, several hundred kilometers, we would have to have an earthquake on the order of something like an eight, seven and a half or eight, or maybe even larger, to get this kind of liquefaction going on right here. But it's also possible that there could be basement structures that aren't really exposed well, but maybe some of those are the types of things that are causing the earthquakes. And I think uh, Bob's pager went off while we were having lunch and uh, there was an earthquake that was around Lake Powell, and some of these could be happening along some basement structures, and maybe some of those could still be re responsible for this type of deformation. So I want to leave you with this image. Um, this is what soft sediment deformation looks like in eolian deposits, windblown deposits, when there's been an earthquake and the water table rises and just shakes, shakes the, you know, whatever out of those sediments. And think about this, and, sh and uh, I'm going to uh, fade to a picture of Mars. And we actually use these examples to show the same kinds of features on Mars. The only way to get this kind of feature is to have high water table, to have water that's actually saturating sediments and have some strong ground motion, uh, something that's actually triggering uh, the deformation of those original sediments. And so again, this is how we're using some of the examples on Mars to help us interpret the geology, uh, excuse me, the examples on Earth to interpret the geology of Mars. Another example of soft sediment deformation are these things that you probably haven't seen. 
And these are what we call plastic pipes. And they kind of look like trees just sticking out of the rock. But these are actually cylindrical pipes of sandstone. Um, and those are slightly better cemented because those are preferential pathways for fluids to move around. And when there's all this strong ground motion, all this shaking going on, sometimes there's these little fingers of sand that actually pop up. And they look just like a tree or a column of sand. And uh, these are fairly well known in the records, although there's not many places where they're in such high concentrations as they are in southern Utah. And I've had one student measure over 900 of these pipes. And they're all clustered together. And this is a place where you get all the right convergence of the conditions that give rise to these kinds of plastic pipes. Here's an example of what one looks like. You can see one of these pipes just sticking right up. It's more resistant to weathering, so it kind of stands up like a pedestal or um, like a finger sticking up. And you can see that there's some coloration around this, this white color. And this is from fluids that have moved up along this pathway and actually bleached the sandstone white. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of this coloration. But the main point is, here is that by looking at some of these kinds of features, again, we're getting an idea about the role of water table, um, how the um, lithology influences the geometry of these, and where porosity and permeability is, um, and how uh, the sediments respond to liquefaction and strong ground motion. And we have seen some features that look very similar to this on Mars although they're a much bigger scale, just like some of the other things I showed you were much bigger scales on Mars. So the applications are that many of these are important for exploration because they're finding some of these injectites, some of these kinds of features, even in seismic sections in the subsurface. And if they can find some of these, these can actually be connecting um, uh, reservoir bodies. So it's really important to, to know where those are. All right, so to summarize this idea of soft sediment deformation, there's lots of different scales, there's different expressions, and a lot of this is telling us about the paleo environment, that sand is susceptible to liquefaction, and there are probably earthquakes as well as Mars quakes that are responsible for some of this kind of deformation. And the frontier area, the area that's still the uncharted territory, is trying to figure out what is the role of water. How has water affected these kinds of things, both on Earth and on Mars? And can some of these intervals actually be important marker beds, actually areas that we can correlate and uh, tell us more about where fluids might have been in the past? So many of these might be called seismites, but again, uh, these are have lots of different types of expressions. OK, now I want to move to the story of diagenesis. And because maybe not everybody uh, knows the rock cycle and knows the different rock types, I like to show cars because we all understand cars. So igneous uh, grains are like this. They're fresh and pristine, like uh, uh, straight off of the, uh, the factory in Detroit. <laughs> and uh, metamorphic ones, grains, are like these that have been squashed and subjected to high pressure. So it's actually changed their shape. And sedimentary grains are like these, these old beat-up BWs. And some of the challenges of sedimentary grains are that we want to figure out where have they been, and what is their story, and how many miles have they traveled to get to where they are. Um, sedimentary grains are ones that form at low temperatures and pressures, just like these things sitting out on the surface. And diagenesis is the stuff that happens after the grains come to rest. So if you're looking at this picture, diagenesis would be like this moss. The moss is something that's happened after the grains have come to rest. And when we look at sedimentary rocks, things like cement are some of the things that are diagenesis. Those are records of diagenesis. It's still important to the history because it's, it's all stuff that's happening that tells us a story. So diagenesis is reflected by many of the different colors that we see in sandstones. And Mother Nature has used iron as its color palette, its artistry palette. It's the iron that's making all these colors of red, purple, yellow, white, uh, all this kind of beautiful coloration. And not only that, but um, a lot of the diagenesis is reflected in some of these things that maybe you've heard called moky marbles. Um, these are cemented mineral masses that we call concretions. And even the colors here are representing different minerals. So these are iron oxide ones that are brown, these green ones are malachite, and these blue ones are azurite. 
And those are deposited and precipitated after the grains are already you know, in the subsurface. So the idea of how this works is that we think many of the uh, grains get a very thin film of iron oxide early in its history. Um, and very soon after deposition, they might get this rusty film around it. And a little bit of red makes, makes a little bit of iron goes a long way. And then when these are buried in the subsurface, certain fluids are capable of bleaching and turning the sandstone white and changing some of the color. And then the iron that was removed in these bleached areas later meets with oxygenated groundwater and causes the re-precipitation of the iron into these kinds of balls. So iron has gone from being all disseminated like this on the left to being in these concentrated balls on the right. And so for a model to show you a little bit more of how this works, we would start off with something like this, where the sandstone is red in the subsurface. We introduce reducing waters. The reducing waters chemically dissolve the iron and put it into solution so that the water is saturated with Fe2+. And then what happens is um, the iron will re-precipitate when you introduce oxygenated groundwater, and it causes the iron to re-precipitate into these balls that are all self-organized um, and spaced out. And this is similar to the roll front models um, and looking at redox fronts. Um, you probably could have some precursor minerals that are just later oxidized, but this is uh, a model that, um, that does seem consistent with other types of mineralogies as well. So you might be wondering what kinds of fluids are capable of bleaching and reducing. Um, well, there could be things like petroleum that can actually bleach sandstones white. Um, and here you see a tar sand right here. It, this is in the Entrada sandstone. And you'll notice on either side there are these bleached selvages that are kind of yellow colored. And so that's just showing you how the oil sand, the oil that's in here, is actually capable of bleaching or removing some of the color, which would have originally been this kind of uh, pinkish salmon color. And then you could have methane that can do the same type of thing, or even organic acids. So here is where there was a root, and the organic root itself was making this locally reducing environment, and that's why that part remained <coughs> white. So um, in thinking about this, I went to an area where we have all these features con um, converging together. Where do we have bleached sandstone? Where do we have hydrocarbons? And where do we have these iron um, oxide concretionary forms? And the white room sandstone is one of those places that shows us where I think that the white color is from the bleaching of hydrocarbons. And this is one of the few Beverly Hillbillies type places that I've been to where it's actually kind of oozing out of the outcrop. You can see the oil just dripping out here. And you do see some of these iron oxide precipitates. And there are also little balls too, not just these bigger forms that I show. And when we're thinking about this on a large scale, and how do we use coloration to tell us about what fluids are doing, you can see that this is really an exhumed reservoir. We have the white room sandstone that's in the foreground that's bleached white. And you can see that there's an envelope of bleaching where it's kind of this yellow. This is in the Moenkopi formation, which is a fine grain unit and would normally be considered a cap rock and impermeable but there's still been enough leakage of probably gases that have actually bleached this so you can actually see the coloration that's telling us about how fluids react uh, in a reservoir. And we can make inferences about what this might uh, do in the subsurface, particularly as people are looking to storing CO2 in emolian reservoirs. So the significance of all of this is that we can use different types of facies, we can look at the permeability and characterize these reservoirs um, a lot of the coloration is telling us about the diagenetic complexities and how iron is actually cycling through the Earth's crust. And a lot of these colors are really reflecting um, the movement of, of iron uh, historically and geologically. And so this has applications to hydrocarbons, where they might be and where they've been, as well as whether or not some of these would make good reservoirs for storage. Um, now, I want to go to Mars and where we're going to take this story of diagenesis. Um, in 2003, the rovers uh, <coughs> Spirit and Opportunity were launched at these two area, to these two areas. And one of the areas is Meridian of Planum. This is an equatorial area that they knew had crystalline hematite from some of the spectral images. And they wanted to go there because um, hematite is typically deposited in the presence of water. 
So the idea is we would follow the water by following the, the hematite, and people thought that it was going to be in these banded iron formations, these layered uh, uh, iron oxides. But what they found was something very different. And when they landed, this is the area um, that they were targeting. This, is, this black dot is where the rover had landed. The rover balloon actually bounced into a small crater. Um, this was called, they named it Eagle Crater because it was like a ball going into the, um, the hole uh, engulfing, and an eagle is a good shot. And so the rover balloon bounced into this little crater. And then this is the outcrop photo after the um, rover unfurled. Um, and this is showing the thermal emission spectroscopy that's superimposed on the outcrop photo. So what we have are uh, red colors, mean high amounts of iron. Uh, white means low amounts of iron or no iron. And then these are intermediate areas of iron. These are actually places where the rover balloon bounced and pushed some of the iron into the margin soil. But you'll see that the distribution of the iron is very similar to some of these areas of southern Utah. So this would be high amounts of iron, where we have the coloration and some of these concretions, really just like ball bearings all over the outcrop. And then these would be areas where it's been bleached, and that would be similar to these low areas of iron. And what was really exciting is that um, my, my group had predicted that we thought that uh, concretionary iron was a much better explanation for meridiana planum than the banded iron that everybody was thinking would be there. And so when the first images actually came back, we were really excited to see our hypothesis um, be correct. And so here is a picture showing some of the iron spherules. And they called these things blueberries, because if you could see them with your naked eye, it would probably look like this, kind of a bluish gray color. And they also found that the blueberries, um, and this is an image that has false color, so the blueberries are colored yellow here, just to make them stick out, stand out. But the blueberries are actually spaced out in the outcrop, sort of like blueberries in a muffin. They aren't all touching each other and all just in one spot, but they're actually physically spaced out. And it's this physical spacing that we have with concretions over here on the right from Utah. This is what tells us that these are formed by subsurface groundwaters. The, the rock is saturated with um, fluids in the phreatic zone, and that's what's giving rise to these precipitations in these round balls. And the ball is the minimum free energy shape. So if you look at these examples, Mars is on the left, uh, Utah is on the right. Here's an example showing some of the layering, and you can see one little blueberry poking out right here, and it has a ridge on it, like this. A little bit like a flying saucer. And when we look at Earth examples, we see the same types of things. There is a concretion in place, and it's got this ridge on it. And the ridge is parallel to the bedding. And the reason why you get those ridges is because there's different permeability parallel to the bedding. And so the iron can diffuse faster along here, and that's what gives rise to some of these kinds of shapes. Another thing that was really interesting, although the, the spherules or these round balls are the most common shapes, there were also conjoined forms of doublets and triplets. And uh, here's a triplet that was found on, imaged on Mars. On Earth, we have all kinds of shapes, and people often ask me, why is the one on Mars like a snowman, and the ones on Earth are like Mickey Mouse ears? <laughs> uh, and I say, well, we actually can get all kinds. We can get snowman. We can get things lined up. We can get uh, clusters of grapes or spiky balls. Uh, we can get all those kinds of forms. And all of these uh, forms are different sizes. These are like golf ball sizes, about five centimeters, all the way down to some of these small sizes. But each ball is kind of representing a population. Um, so there are populations of these very small sizes, and then there's more rare areas where the population is all bigger sizes. But the size of these blueberries on Mars is about 4.2 millimeters, and that's about this size right in here. The smaller sizes are much more common than these bigger ones, though. So in order to figure out was the iron really inside of these blueberries, they went to a place where these blueberries had accumulated in a little depression. They called that the berry bowl. And that's where they did the analysis uh, with the Mossbauer instrument. And it shows these characteristic six peaks that says that the mineralogy is indeed hematite. And as the rock abrasion tool scraped away at the outcrop, they could scrape away some of these uh, spherules to see that they look relatively solid 
with hematite on the inside. Now, on Earth, we have similar types of examples. Some of them are solid on the inside, but some of them are rinds. And they're, they're, they're quite a bit different looking um, as you look at the interior structure. These examples right here, this is one of my favorite spots in um, southern Utah. These are all about the size of grapefruit. And so they're all about that big around. And these have uh, little dots, little micro concretions that are really kind of making up the outer parts. And so this looks like an avocado skin if you, if you look really close. And those are probably little nucleation sites that coalesce together. But one of the questions people ask me is why are the ones on Earth so much different? Or why do we get so many more varieties on Earth as opposed to Mars? Well, I do think that Mars has its own unique chemistry. And instead of having hydrocarbons that are mobilizing iron, iron is already in the reduced state in some of the basaltic sediments. And all you need is acid type waters to mobilize the iron on Mars. So it is a slightly different chemistry. But one of the things that I think is really important is when we're looking at sedimentary rocks on Earth, there's probably no water on the surface of Earth since the Precambrian, since you know three something billion years ago that hasn't had microbes in it. All of the water on Earth has microbes in it. And especially when we're precipitating things at Earth's surface temperatures and pressures, I would actually assert that everything is contaminated with life, and we probably don't even know what abiotic really looks like. Because everything that we're looking at has got microbes in the waters, and, and the microbes are making things happen. So I think there are some difficulties in that, that we have a biased view because so much of Earth is contaminated with life. Now, to further illustrate this point, one of my colleagues was actually um, looking at dinosaur bones in the Triassic, um, the Ghost Ranch, Georgia, O'Keefe country. And one of the things that he noticed is that when they were excavating bones out of some of these layers, like in here, they found that every time they found bones, they would find concretions. And the relationship was so strong that if they found concretions, that were like these things here, and this is a thin section of some of these. If they found concretions, they knew they would find bones. And not only that, when they took a close look, they often found that the concretions were attached to the ends of bones. So you see a bone right here, concretion is attached here, and one's attached here, and here's a bone in the outcrop, and one's actually attached to the side of the bone. And these concretions are a little bit more complex They've got um, pyrite and goodthite and hematite in the middle here, and then there's some of this colorless area is some of the gypsum. So we've been actually thinking more about this. Why would the concretions be forming on the ends of the bones? Do you have any ideas? Well, we think, you know, at the ends of bones, that could be where there's cartilage or where there's muscle tissue that might still be somehow left there. Maybe it's just enough to actually cause the nucleation and the preferential precipitation around some of those areas. And we already know in lots of geologic examples, we see how fossils are preferentially replaced by pyrite or other types of, of minerals. And so biology is really important in understanding some of these geologic phenomena um, at the Earth's surface. Um, some of the new things that are going on, uh, we're trying to actually date some of these iron oxides. Normally, there isn't much material that we can date, but there's a new method of uranium, thorium, and helium chronometry. Um, the dates are uh, a little bit um, difficult to interpret because we don't quite know what the closure temperature of helium is. But it does seem that most of the dates are very consistently young. And so these would be things that would be on the order of less than 5 million years. And some of them might even be on the order of th just thousands of years. So if I were to look into my crystal ball, um, this is what I would see in the future. There's lots of mysteries that we still don't understand. And this one is one of my favorite examples. This is in southern Nevada. And my son is standing on this one just to kind of give you an idea of the size of that one. There's this area where these giant iron oxide concretions are just like beach balls. And there's about 20 of them. Um, and while carbonate concretions can get quite large, like the Meraki boulders in New Zealand or something, um, iron oxide ones are not generally that, that large. And so uh, one of the things we're thinking about is what made these so large. And one of the interesting things is that there's petrified wood in the same formation where these 
these uh, big balls come from. So if I summarize diagenesis, there's complex stories of fluid flow, and it's all telling us about groundwater moving through. Um, and it's telling us about applications that we can take from Earth to understand Mars. And really, I think the frontier area that we have yet to really understand is what is the role of biology in helping and aiding the precipitation of many of these diagenetic minerals. OK, the last topic is what's in the future. There are changes in the wind. This one's holding up my husband. And if we think about geology, this was then and this is now. What is the difference between these two pictures? This looks like about 30 years ago. Got a brown compass yeah. versus a computer. Yeah, <laughs> and actually you probably can't really see it, but he's uh, got his right in the rain notebook there. And so the real difference is, you know, what are we actually using to record our data and our information in the field? Um, there's also another important difference, and that is um, that half of the population now of geologists, especially in academia, are women. And I would have actually shown a picture of a woman here, but all the women were on the outcrop. And it was only the man who was sitting down on the computer. But you can imagine. And so uh, this actually is another picture to show you the difference. And the thing that's really important is that new technology is going to change the way that we do science. And NSF, the National Science Foundation, has put together an initiative um, with the Geoinformatics Division that's called EarthCube. And EarthCube is bringing together all the kinds of things that we do in our science with open data sharing and actually using geoinformatics to actually help us do better science. Now this is a tough thing because geologists are used to just keeping our notebooks to ourselves and putting it on our shelf and that's our data and we don't want to share that data. But the way that the most advances can help happen in the science is if we share the data. And if some geologists die, sometimes all those uh, file cabinets of all that information just gets taken out to the dumpster because we don't know what to do with it. And yet, if we have a mechanism for actually entering data and sharing it, and we're actually now recapturing a lot of information through very sophisticated optical scanning programs, and we can take somebody's file cabinet of, of data and actually scan it, and then preserve some of that. So this idea of, of uh, NSF is to bring all of these things together. And the goal of EarthCube is to really advance our science so that we can meet all these grand challenges and to actually leverage the cyber infrastructure technology that currently exists to help us do a better job of, of meeting these grand challenges. And I do have to say that there are now some databases that have been opened up and it's actually allowing us to answer questions that we never could do so easily before. So we can now actually go and say, given all the literature, where are all the concretions found that have this particular composition? I mean, that's because things can go into a database and we have these, this computer technology that's changing things. Now, uh, I want to show you how a lot of this can be put onto a, um, a GIS platform. And you know, ideally, what we should have for Earth science is a Google Earth type of platform where all the scientific data can go into that. They have, we can't do that yet, but I want to show you an example because they're starting to do that for uh, planetary data. And this one shows Mars. So um, the uh, musical play here on my computer. But this is called Mars Prep, and this is where uh, they've plotted a lot of the data. And what it allows you to do is look at different kinds of missions. So you can look at all the different Mars missions, and you can actually look at the data on the planetary scale and compare between different data sets. That's something that we couldn't easily do before. You can actually browse different types of resolutions, and so you can go to the highest, what we call the high-rise uh, resolution, which is 25 centimeters per pixel. And you can go into different areas and actually do calculations. You can draw a line and say, give me an instantaneous profile of that topographic elevation. And can you imagine if we could do that with a geologic cross-section or something like that? Um, Here's uh, showing where are the current ro uh, orbiters and what are they taking pictures of. You can actually print Mars terrains on a 3D printer. So you can select an area and say, print that off on a 3D printer. And you can get the relief. Um, you can make different kinds of bookmarks on the maps. So 
So this is Mike showing the Curiosity uh, landing site that's in Gale Crater. You can kind of back out and see what the relationship is to that moat or that crater. You can see uh, the different pathways. And then um, I think, I can't really read the writing, but um, one of the things that they wanted to show was uh, from the Martian movie, what was the pathway that um, Watney actually took to get from the half, uh, and he had to go across a uh, very rugged terrain here, uh, going past some valleys and, and other types of things. So you can do things uh, with data that you could never do before. Uh, this one's called Mars Trek, and um, one of the things that they are going to be able to do is to actually link all the metadata all the sources, so you could go to a spot and say, tell me all the science that's been done at that spot, tell me what the references are and who did it, and tell me what samples they collected or, or whatever. Um, this is going to really change how we do science, and, and if you're at the talk tomorrow, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other uh, types of programs that are available to you. Um, so to summarize uh, for tonight, I, I hope I've given you a, an overview of the sedimentology of, of my PDs. <coughs> Dunes, deformation, and diagenesis, and all of these have relevance to exploration, the traditional type of exploration we do, as well as some of the new exploration to other planets. Um, in particular, one of the things that's fascinated me are some of these records of strong ground motion, and things that I think represent earthquakes. And then many of the patterns and the colorations of fluid flow are pre well preserved on Earth as well as on Mars. And even these blueberries on Mars are telling us the story of fluid flow. We're actually able to merge Earth and planetary science in ways that never happened before. And if somebody had told me that I was going to teach a class on Mars, you know, when I first started my career, <laughs> I would have just laughed and said, I know nothing about, I've never even taken a planetary science class. You know, what I learned about planetary science was in fourth grade. Um, but really, the, the fields have come together. And to do the best uh, exploration on other planets, it helps to have a really good understanding of all the kinds of variability that we have here on Earth. So it's really exciting that these fields are, are merging together. And then I want to leave you with the idea that future technology um, and the next generation of students, the young people, are going to be able to do things that we never dreamed were possible. And they are the ones that get to do the new frontiers of <laughs> the next generation. So thank you very much. Totally abiotic. Mm. 
I As a follow-up to Bob's yeah, question. I think it's possible that they could be abiotic. Mm -hmm. And actually, we can do lab, um, some of my colleagues have done lab top experiments. And they actually can generate those concretionary forms um, using what they think are sterile uh, chemicals. And they're very concentrated chemicals, so it's not geologically realistic. Um, but they're doing it so that it'll precipitate in the timelines that we want it to. So I think things can happen abiotically, but the important thing is that things can happen much better and much faster with uh, biological components. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, in terms of life on Mars, um, what is the definition of the most basic form of life? I mean, how far down can you go? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't really know the answer to that. I don't know if there's some biologists that want to uh, I mean, they're looking for, <laughs> I don't know, you want to answer this? <coughs> no. <laughs> some kind of DNA and, and some kind of molecular structures that have carbon and, yeah. I, you know, but, and, and it raises the question is would life forms on different planets be the same as, as Mars? I don't know. Yes. With our explorers, we know what the atmosphere and the conditions are on Mars now. But looking at the geology and the other things that you're seeing, can you extrapolate back as to what the atmosphere and conditions were in the past and what happened to the atmosphere of Mars? Yeah, yeah. That's an uh, uh, age-old question is what happened. I mean, certainly people think that um, at one time Mars was much more water-rich than it is now, and probably early on in its evolution it had more of an atmosphere, and then maybe all those things have changed with solar winds, uh, and, and it's lost its ability to hold things, and so you know we don't see water sitting on the surface, but people do think that water is very close to the subsurface. That's, that's, that's what it looks like you're saying. Yes. It looks like there's a lot of oxygen bound up if it's in subsurface water, or in the iron oxide, there's still a lot of oxygen, but it's all bound up. Um, some of it is. And, and some of the water that they actually uh, are seeing in some of these streaks that they found, uh, um, they call them RSLs, recurring slope lineas. Um, those they think are kind of a brine. And, um, and those brines are able to persist um, you know, with, with more extreme conditions than, than water. Yes? Could you talk a little bit more about those dunes? It was a slide that was earlier, and you said these were Martian dune forms that we don't seem to have an analog about on yeah. Earth. Yeah, usually on Earth we have um, very big dune forms, and then we have ripples, which are the smaller forms that are on these dunes. And there's sort of this regular repeating structure of these more sinuous crested uh, kinds of features that were imaged on the um, on the ground at Kale Crater. And so people are thinking that those are maybe suggesting different atmospheric conditions than we have now, and that maybe those are old features. What I'm kind of struggling with, and that particular piece of work is not my science. I, I was just showing some other things that have been reported. But it seems to me that if they were older, that, that things would have been modified, and that you wouldn't still see that form today. So I don't know how to resolve that. Uh, question, other than saying this is what other people have reported. So there are no analogs then that you've been able to find for, for something similar to those then on Yeah, not, not quite, yeah, exactly. Yes? You uh, talked about iron being the principle uh, within the water that was doing a lot of the color, color deformation. Uh, what about other things that are carried in the water, other minerals? Do you see much effect of those? Uh, there certainly are other elements that get carried. Whether they're as visible as the iron, you know, uh, I mean like even uh, these concretionary forms that I talk about, you can get um, barite types of concretions and those are kind of white, white colored. Uh, but I think uh, the iron is just one of those colors that leaves this very telltale um, signature that you can see and it's also uh, very useful because we can detect iron, you know, fairly easily with with instruments, and it doesn't have to be um, these trace elements. Some of the other things are su such small amounts that as trace elements, they're really hard to find unless you have the physical rock and you can actually analyze it. 
But the concretions were in these concentrated balls enough so that they, that they could analyze them. Yes? Uh, I, 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 I've noticed in uh, the belt series up in northern Montana uh, that precambrian rocks, mm -hmm. there's quartzite there, thick quartzite, that have balls, lots of balls in them that are concretions, oh. that are mined as, as a copper deposit right now. Mm. Uh, do you have any samples? No, I do not. Oh, I haven't heard of that. But that, no, it's, it's uh, called Star Lake, S-P-A-R, Lake in, in Montana, Western Montana. Hmm. It's in the Bell series, uh, and, and a pure white quartzite. Hmm. I mean, uh, oh, the it's, ball, in, the, it's the in the quartzite. The balls are up to the quarter size of okay. the Okay, yeah. Uh, I thought you meant, meant it was in some of these chert layers in the banded iron formation, but you're saying it's actually in the quartzite. In the quartz on. Yeah, okay. And I, what it appears is that uh, the, the, uh, there was a carbonate cement in, the, in between the sand grain. There was fluid flow through the rock. Mm -hmm. And it somehow nucleated. Mm -hmm. And the, the, it drew the, the, the uh, iron and the uh, copper minerals yes. out of the solution, precipitated them out, and they form a nice concentric ball. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it, it's in a quartzite, so you yeah. you never get a ball. You Maybe get you can a later slice show me the, the, the info, and I, I'd be interested in looking into that more. Yeah. Can you calculate the amount of um, they can, can you repeat the question? Uh, can, can you calculate the uh, predominant minerals on Mars? Um, most of the Mars sandstones are basaltic sandstone, and that's very different from the quartz sandstones that we have here on Earth. Um, and in some cases, they can do certain kinds of calculations. Um, the uh, Opportunity rover has lost its ability to do the detailed things that it, was, it used to be able to do. And I think most of you know that the Opportunity rover was only supposed to, only guaranteed to last for three months. Yeah. And it's been going now for, you know, I forget what it is, 2004, so like 13 years. Um, so they said that's pretty good uh, warranty for an American vehicle. <laughs> and uh, so it can't do the same things that it could. Um, some of the things that uh, the Opportunity rover, I mean, excuse me, the um, Curiosity rover is doing can be very sophisticated. And they can do percentages and, and that type of thing. Yeah. Trace elements, though, are difficult. Yeah. So you have a picture of banded iron. Uh -huh. uh, is there banded iron on Mars? And, and can you talk about how banded iron is formed? <laughs> can you repeat the question uh, again? Are there banded irons on Mars? And can we discuss can you talk how, about how banded iron is formed here? Can I talk so there about is how banded iron? Yes. Earth. Yeah, there is banded iron on Earth, and I wish I could probably do a better job of explaining it. They have not found any banded iron formation on Mars to date. There are some places where there are what they call like a hematite ridge. There are places where it seems to be enriched, and it's kind of like a layered type of thing of hematite. But I think it's probably a pretty good chance that it's just a concretionary layer. Um, but that's not something they've actually gotten to, to analyze yet. Um, and in the the formation of banded iron, you know, here on Earth, um, these are different conditions between reducing conditions and oxygenating conditions that um, have to do with kind of the the early evolution um, in some of the ocean waters and the idea that iron was coming off of some of the continents and actually in the water and then if you have cyanobacteria and you have microbes they're actually able to uh, help change the composition of the water they go through photosynthesis release the oxygen which is complexing with the iron and then you're able to precipitate out some of these uh, iron rich layers and you're actually changing the composition of the atmosphere to the more oxygenating uh, conditions that we have now instead of the reducing conditions of the, of the early, uh, early times. So uh, certainly even in the band and iron formation, people believe that bacteria have been important in, in the uh, formation of, of the iron rich minerals and affected really globally the atmosphere composition. That's bottom. <laughs> 
Are there, what other analogs on Earth of these deformed sandstone sequences that are going on today? Uh, some of the, the studies of these deformed sequences on Earth that are going on? Yeah, that's active uh, now. Uh, you, well, we're looking at ancient examples. Um, I'm not sure if you mean modern. Uh, the, the active different, I mean, the active, I'm just trying to think of the relationship yeah. to seismicity yeah. today and how they might relate to earthquake belts and active right. systems. I mean, in modern places, like even in the New Madrid fault zone, you would see these little sand volcanoes. After the Christchurch earthquake, there were sand volcanoes and stuff. What we don't know is what those things look like if you were able to expose them or look at them in 2D or 3D. And that's what these kinds of rock exposures tell us, is, is how these things actually look. Um, you know, unless you're able to dig a trench or something in a modern environment, you don't really see what it looks like, what the plumbing looks like underneath. All you see is the sand volcano that seems to erupt from, uh, from this liquefaction. So it, I think it's difficult, and maybe what we have to do is more modeling and more comparison of, these, of some of these ancient examples. These ancient examples, it's hard to tell whether they actually erupted on the surface, because you're not always intersecting the, the core and actually being able to connect them onto things that would have been on the surface. Yes. One more. <laughs> so Elon, Elon Musk just announced goals to set up a colony on Mars. Yeah. Do you think that, like, you're relatively soon? Do you think the science is gonna be advanced enough to get us there? <laughs> do I think the science will be good enough to get us there? And I and I know last week I was out of town, but Obama talked about uh, uh, making a goal of 2030 to um, to have humans on Mars and bring them back. I I, I think. Um, that's going to be difficult. Yes. I think, though, it's good to have these dreams and goals of pushing our technology as far as we can. And I, uh, you know, if you look historically, um, space exploration did a lot for the spirit and the, uh, the just technological advances. Uh, so the space exploration program has really uh, helped us have the internet that we have today, and, and so many other things that relate to medical breakthroughs and other types of things that I think. The, the idea of trying to push ourselves to explore is important. There's still a lot of ethical issues, I feel, about should humans go to Mars? Or would we contaminate another planet? And would we do to Mars the same thing we've done to Earth? You know, I, I'm a little bit wary of that, but I think it's important to push the science that we should explore as much as we can. Yes? I just want to make a comment on your comment about data collection and instrumentation uh, and the progress of that. You know, we can only live so long, and in the past, when we died, our information died with us. But now we can pass this on to generation after generation, and they can build on what we did mm -hmm. rather than lose what we did. Mm -hmm. And then look at it in a pictorial representation, which is much better to look at than just old numbers. I've, I've had to work with that a lot, and I'm very excited about yeah. that for the future. Well, uh, with that, uh, I think we'll call it a day, and I think you can see that. Don't walk off, aren't you? <laughs> uh, I think you can see a true educator. <laughs> Someone that can explain some very complex concepts as clearly as she did. And uh, as much as John Heberger is known for taking outstanding photographs, this talk is filled with some of the most beautiful images I think I've ever seen. But uh, we thank you very much for coming. The arduous distance from Salt Lake all the way up here. And I know it's not answered. Oh, thank you. But uh, it is, you know, a place we happen to like. And, uh, <laughs> we didn't get to see it like this today. <laughs> well, that just means you have to come back. Thank you very much. Uh,